every one of us has a story to tell and that what is one day great literature and great art begins very close to our hearts within our houses and with people not necessarily the you know the ones from with the big lights and the names up in big lights and things like that uh, but those whom we hold very close to our hearts and whose struggles are real so without much ado further ado i am going to hand over this session uh, this part of the session to uh, shilpa and ask her to take over right now thank you thank you so much for introducing me shobhna mainly i think i can introduce uh, a little bit of my journey and tell you where i am today um during the lockdown i started a series as a part of the urban folk project uh, social media um we had on on the social media we started a campaign where we wanted to teach songs so we put up 10 songs and we got a lot of traction and a lot of people um like the videos watch the videos and over time i was wondering what that traction meant um no matter how much of reading we do and how much of engagement what kind of whatever kind of engagement we have with folk um i'm very aware i'm made aware <laughs> again and again that i'm not a folk artist and i cannot be a folk artist um it's uh, the lens in with with which i view it is both personal and um mainly uh, as a theater practitioner so when i started i heard my grandmother songs from a very young age but when i started putting it out i realized how easily things commodify and what folk has to be again redefined for yourself if you have to continue practicing it and come continue putting it out um while you turn into a band and your songs become music videos and <laughs> strange things start to happen with the work um your body of research so this point what i realized was uh, for me it was more important important to engage with the arts through the practitioners and when you say practitioners it also means their community their politics um the their personal struggles and what that means to the larger economy of that small town or you know how they fit in and uh, by making a certain artist popular or a certain form popular you cannot um what do you say promote or save folk so to speak especially in a time where we are questioning the word folk itself um i feel i've taken a step back as a practitioner and i've <laughs> have gone into hermetic mode so i'm here in gulbarga which is very close to murdi my hometown um i'm i've come back because i believe somewhere within my narrative and my community's narrative i am finding folk forms that better speak for my um my thoughts right now uh even even if it's about speaking about gender or sexuality or nationality there are references that i hear within folk forms like gigi pada or yellamanata um the origin folk myths of certain communities these are resounding ideas i mean that that you can draw upon it becomes like a it's it's what do you say they they all kind of living archives and i'm kind of wondering how it is that we can archive it without killing it like does it become dead once it goes into a shell or do we have to find a way to embody it observe it be a part of it work with the land to stand song applies to your body when you sing it um so that that's that's where i am in and and in in my journey of folk research i believe somewhere within the folk the this space i will find folk practitioners who are willing to teach willing to perform willing to be observed are willing to come live life with us and it's not a space like bangalore because uh while i was doing this work in bangalore i think i was uh performing constantly we had several shows but what was what is mainly lacking was the connection we had with the practitioners which came by being in the field and being in the field was something that we did apart from living our lives in the city so i think um 
I have come back to Gulbarga to also understand what that what that means to live in the folk space and how the space can reject you or accept you. It's really built on human relationships, your acceptance of rituals, habits, norms, and um, so on and so forth. There's a song, like my grandmother's songs, um, they're all in her head and when they, they emerge, sometimes they take years to come. This is one such song, it's not complete. But there is a mention of a Kabir. And this Kabir, he has a wife who he is going to pledge at the Saukar's house to bring grain and feed to sadhus. <laughs> um, much of the song is, is still yet to be found, but it goes like this. Sadhu sajana rat pati ad kelari Sadhu sajana rat pati ad kelari Surati maadi gayana kunta kelari sarvajana Surati maadi gayana kunta kelari sarvajana Kabira na manya ga sadur jana siva ram ram. The song is close to 25 verses long. And it's a long tale. It's, been, it's, it's usually sung during uh, Moharam. Um, because Moharam is very different here. It's, it's, uh, there's, there are very different rituals where they sing Moharam Ramayana. They sing overnight and these are one of the songs Kabira's story is told. Being, um, uh, being a, a musician who hasn't had a formal education in music, I feel it gives me strength. And so I keep going back to folk. I feel that's where I learn most. Um, yeah, I leave you with that thought. Actually, I've, I'm already so charged up with so much that, you know, Shilpa said. What, what I actually plan to speak about was my about my practice and what I have been doing yeah. uh, especially focusing on the storytelling part yeah. of it and um, Shilpa spoke about um, oral traditions and the transference of it the preservation of it um, and it's so tempting like you I, so many stories come to mind when you think about uh, oral traditions and the way, you know, especially because my world is of the Hindustani classical um, uh, world, um, which is so hugely, you know, uh, Guru Shishya based and it, yes, it is taught in colleges and universities, but most of the teaching happens on a personal level between a Guru and a Shishya. Um, so there are so many of those stories that I've heard um about um how this transference happens you know um i would like to uh, talk about uh, how in storytelling um i mean we do know that you know the, the history is always written by the victors and you know stories are always given uh, given to us um, a lot of the times from a single perspective mm -hmm. and uh, very often we we fail to look for the other storyteller um and uh, and in my work, I have kind of some uh, some of the work that I have done um, is also about this that looking for the other angle in the story or the other storyteller or the other perspective piece I want to talk about, uh, which is uh, a musical piece. Uh, it's it's more like a musical uh, storytelling piece that I have done with uh, another singer, fantastic singer called Bindu Malini. And uh, it's called uh, Threshold. So what uh, Threshold does is it attempts to uh, basically retell stories, just slightly shifting the gaze of the gender. This story goes like this. I'll read it out. Mozart was born in 1751 to Leopold and Anna Maria. Mozart started learning to play the harpsichord as a child and soon could play it very well. Leopold, to showcase his child's talents, took the young Mozart to many cities. 
Mozart soon was a very popular young harpsichord player and pianist, and also started writing musical compositions. Slowly, Mozart grew into becoming a supremely talented young adult. One day, Leopold said to Mozart, you have now reached a marriageable age. You should stop putting your artistic talents on display. Mozart agreed, stopped performing, and according to the family's wishes, Mozart married a magistrate. Maria Anna Walburga Ignatia Mozart married Johann Sonnenberg. And Maria Ignatia Mozart's younger brother, Wolfgang Mozart, continued with his musical pursuits. So this is a story that we tell where you know the name Mozart so well, uh, you are so familiar with Mozart's works and you listen to the whole story thinking I'm talking about Wolfgang Mozart, mm. but we are actually talking about Mozart's sister who also had the same kind of talent, uh, probably also was a prodigy, but because of, you know, uh, this, uh, that she was just not allowed to um, continue with her music. There's no Carnatic music without Tyagaraja. So there is a temple for Tyagaraja in Tirvayur. And uh, the story about the temple and this, uh, you know, every year on his birthday, I guess, uh, people from Carnatic musician, musicians from all over the world gather in Tirvayur and pay uh, homage to Tyagaraja. They sing his compositions together, men, women, children, old, young, everybody. But this, the story behind it is that um, the shrine for Tyagaraja was built by this person called Bangalore Nagaratnama, who was a Devadasi. So she built, and she was, of course, uh, she had enough money to build the shrine. She built the shrine and uh, then the, uh, uh, what do you say, the Aradhana started happening, but it was only men who sang women were not allowed to sing along with men in the, uh, on stage together. They never were seen together. Mm -hmm. So Bangalore Nagaratnama insisted that the women also should be allowed to pay an homage to Tyagaraja. And the scholars, the men said, no, uh, men, women cannot sit next to men on stage. And Bangalore Nagaratnama uh, was persuasive. She was persuasive for 20 years. She fought a battle for 20 years. And finally, they allowed and agreed uh, and allowed uh, women to sit next to men together along with men and everyone sings together. And so now when you see that Aradhana, you see men, women, um, everyone sitting together and performing. But this is the story behind the Aradhana. So these are the stories that we tell about, you know, uh, there's many stories like this, that mm -hmm. where we try to uh, tell you a story that you already know, but just make you look, maybe change the camera angle a little bit, you know, change the frame, change the position of the storyteller and tell you a story, the same story that you know, but with a different mm -hmm. perspective, uh, which is what... Uh, which is something that I'm very interested in. Okay, I'll send you a piece from yeah. Threshold itself. All right. That's um, right. Yeah. So this is, a, 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 this is a, a, a vachana. I will sing you a poem written by Sule Sankava, who was a prostitute. So she, uh, it's one of her vachanas that I'm uh, writing. She also joined the movement, the vachana movement. Um, and this is her uh, vachana, where the tr translation is uh, like this. Uh, her, uh, what do you say, Ankita. Um, uh, Ankita is the, the poetic name that, um, that she, yeah. the poetic signature that she uses, yeah. uh, is um, Nirlajeshwara. Her, her uh, not poetic signature, her Ishtadeva is uh, Nirlajeshwara. Ishtadeva is the god that she is writing for. Yeah. And Nirlajeshwara means the uninhibited Shiva. Uh, and the translation of this poem is, um, in my harlot's trade, uh, having taken one man's money, I dare not ac accept 
a second man's money, sir. If I do, they will stand me naked and they will kill me. If I cohabit with the polluted, my hands, nose, ears, they will cut off. They'll chop off with a red hot knife, sir. I will not do that. But for you, my un uninhibited Shiva. And this is the poem. And this is the song. <clears throat> I would like to ground myself a little bit by saying that for me, especially, um, storytelling began at a very young age. I would say that um, the interest for theater professionally came to me quite later. But I can remember as far back as um, when I was about four or five years old is when my intrigue for storytelling developed when I used to come home and I would not understand. Um, so I, I needed a visual interpretation. Like if someone gave me text and I think ma'am would vouch for the fact that if I'm given something to read and I have to be in a stationary place and just indulge in that reading, that isn't something that I can do. And this is not me fighting a battle against the process of reading. Um, everyone has their distinct challenges that they face with any activity and you as an individual need to figure out um, a process or a, a mechanism that works for you to make that process more exciting. And for me, um, that was theater. I think theater is largely the practical side of reading. And that is what, that is what, or that is where my reading habits started developing. And I was keen to read more because I wanted to see how I can plot it or how I can put it on stage. And the excitement of the visualization of what I was being fed, either read by someone else or from a book, um, really added to my knowledge, to my database. And I think what I was going to say is um, the, storytelling, the storytelling kind of activity began for me very young. And I'm really glad uh, both the previous speakers brought up the um, Guru Shishya system and speaking to their grandmother. Um, about stories because that's where it began. What I'd like to say is as an actor, um, my journey began as a stage manager, but as an actor now, I'm not a storyteller. I'd like to say that I'm a story seller. And I don't mean that in the commercial sense at all. I just mean the sheer excitement or the adrenaline that takes over when you are in the forefront of projecting something or presenting something to an audience. I think that aspect of storytelling story selling in this case is, is very, very exciting for me. And I love the fact that um, Shobna ma'am actually uh, brought up the fact that um, in the academic setting, how does theater or the storytelling aspect, how, do you, how, do, how, do, how can academics play a part or academia in general, how can it support this craft? Because especially in the context of India where academics is largely seen as boring, I don't see it as boring at all. Um, I see it um, as, like, as Ma'am would also verify, is it's, it's, it's a conversation, it's a discourse that you can have, and the, ship, and the process of having that discourse, or meeting together, criticizing, giving feedback, um, writing what you have written, like, the, the, literally the minutes of a, set, of a discourse would be the academic setting of it. And I think that is such an important part 
for theater because so many people only see theater for the final product or like you know what we show for those two hours or repeatedly with what we show for theater over a given period of time but what happened for the six to eight weeks of rehearsal like for instance what were we doing where did that come from so this is where the research kicks in uh, this is where the ensemble practice kicks in i know a lot of my students are like cringing in their seats right now going like yeah i started on ensemble again but it is an ensemble it is a community exercise and and more than anything else it is variations and this is i would say this variation the the word variation might mean something from the dictionary point of view but in the world of theater what we see variation is um the same obstacle that you have the you you might have a, the same objective that you have sorry the same objective that you have and the obstacle that you need to overcome the obstacle that you as an actor are overcoming is changing with every show with every rehearsal with every given circumstances because no two shows are the same and you need to prepare yourself for that on in the rehearsal process where you immerse yourself in such a way that every rehearsal you are giving it the show level of commitment so if you're giving yourself 100% for each rehearsal you're actually increasing that mark or you're increasing your personal 100% come the next rehearsal so for today if i'm giving it 100% then tomorrow whatever i've given today falls far shy of it and you have to try harder to meet that expectation that you've set for yourself you have to have your own your own personal practice in any given situation which may be rehearsal which may be your own rehearsal which may be the theater rehearsal in general it has to be more than 100% because if you're carrying that energy and if your inner vibration is to that level that vibration like the same thing as the concept of vibration in science if one particle is vibrating it forces all of the others and i think all the musicians on the panel will kind of back me up over here that it is it is infect it is infectious that that energy which you bring in and for instance i have been completely charged up by what pallavi and shilpa had to say so far i'm looking forward to what sumit is going to enlighten us with but i can i can more than guarantee that that vibration is so infectious that if you are able to give that level of commitment in that given point of time the whole ensemble has no choice but to participate and that same energy as an ensemble if you are able to recreate on stage speaking that story to the audience the audience have no choice but to partake and that is essentially what the audience have paid the ticket for when i was informed about the topic the power of storytelling uh, three events came to my mind and the first event that came to my mind was that of the arab spring uh, 2011 and the second one was that of black lives matter and the third one was the rohit vemula movement post the suicide of uh, a dalit research scholar in the university of hyderabad and uh, although this uh, although these three events are spanned over different uh, places you know different countries different socio cultural contexts but there was one common theme that united all of these three events and that was the power of storytelling uh, and uh, this power of when i say power of storytelling um, in all of these events you know the mobilization that was done the collective action that followed the mobilization of youths um, was uh, done through storytelling on social media uh, it because in all of these places you know if you look at the blacks in the united states or um, you look at the youths in egypt or tunisia or even the dalit youths in india dalit students in india at that point of time uh, you know there is always this relationship between the marginalized communities and the media right i mean if you look at india itself um, like the large media houses um you know be be it print media be it um the you know tv news channels um they they are owned by a certain group of business owners right they are owned by a certain group of business owners who have their own interests and the kind of stories they would like to present and in that way um cast as a popular narrative was not present in these media houses i mean there were very few skewed narratives that was present uh, you know that was that was presented around caste in these news channels and in this print media and uh, the narratives that ca came from um, the below you know the people who have had lived experiences and uh, the local histories that they bring along and that was something that was not being part of the larger uh, popular narratives and that is something uh, 
in india if i would like you know if i if i want to you know if i would like to personalize it a little bit um how i began storytelling it was during 2016 um it was during 2016 when uh, you know post the death of rohit vermula a lot of students randomly started writing on social media a lot of students especially coming from marginalized castes and communities they started writing about their experiences in higher educational institutions and uh, all of that from different random places came together and people started to connect with each other and this connecting was not just about um, you know associating with each other's shared vulnerable experiences but it was also uh, you know this also led to collective actions you know and that is what i and that is what power means to me you know where your voices are not heard but uh, the social media at that point of time became a medium through which um, you know a large force okay, and and this power and this power of social media and the power of storytelling when where students started writing about their life experiences their experiences in university campuses uh, this was something you know this was a break away from the earlier modes of protests the earlier modes of uh, you know uh, storytelling because even earlier you have a lot of dalit artists in india a lot of antikas artists musicians who go from one village to another you know in maharashtra you have the tradition of the lok shahers where uh, you recite poetry um, you recite stories in, in you know in forms of poetry like a, like a ballad yeah like a ballad and um, but then you go from one village to another then in in uh, the telangana and andhra pradesh you have a lot of telugu dalit poets and uh, uh, so in all of this the only difference that was you know that there was a difference between this and what happened in 2016 and the difference was the outreach right and so i started writing about i started writing about um, the little bit of you know uh, narratives around caste that i knew and i had lived uh, and when i started writing on social media i saw people started connecting to me right and uh, but but i also realized that um how do i reach to more people you know how do i tell the stories to more people because academics is something that at times when you like i i've studied in jnu and i know you know the amount of conferences that happens on a day to day basis you know the amount of conventions the amount of conferences and present you know presentation of papers that happens that people get bored so i wanted to you know i, I didn't want to um create a binary between the popular language and the academic language because my journey was something um, you know it was very interesting because i come from a village in orissa where um where you know the caste experiences or or segregation of spaces and uh, caste brutalities are very visible very crude and then i'm moving on from that space to university space right where um it's not visible it's not outright there but there are certain subtle ways in which how it operates i kind of blended uh, ac- the academic language and the popular narratives that i came you know that, that the place that i uh, that i come from as an artist as a writer i need to absorb myself more and more so that these experiences these um, stories that that i'm talking about is not just on a superficial level um, you know i want to absorb them as much as possible with all kinds of nuances and i think it's a process and so i believe that storytelling is not just a creative medium uh, uh, i mean like i write you know i create content on social media but apart from that i also do live event like live rap performances in different parts of the country and uh, so when i so one thing i've realized this is not just a creative medium but it is also uh, you know a, some sort of a, pedag- a pedagogical tool right where you where you in- interacting with uh, youths especially the youths of uh, especially the youths after 2016 because of the kind of events that have happened in this country so so this is a song that i wrote uh, in 2016 and this song was basically the song talks about how in this country you have the marginalized castes and communities who every day you know work in the field who construct your buildings who are mm-hmm. farmers and um, who are working class basically they produce um, the life sustaining products the life sustaining mm-hmm. you know needs of the society indian society and uh, so uh, when students from these communities they go to universities and they go to colleges there is always a certain sense of differences between them and the ones who come from a certain uh, you know certain elite castes and class groups you know the difference is about how merit is understood right what is merit is merit all about intellectual stimulation of how many books have you read 
or you know or let's say what exposure you you've had um, to the different kind of literature or is it also uh, something that that has to do with um, a certain epistemological privilege where you where you interact with the society on a day to day basis with a with a very crude and um, with the kind of crude realities that operates on everyday basis right and so that is where i'm saying the idea of merit is something that needs to be deconstructed where i'm saying that these people who construct these people who work every day on you know on the everyday basis the producing class the working class of this country they are the ones who have the real merit you know i mean i i shift the conversation on merit to that so the song is about that and yes so here we go yeah so let's have us representing counterculture Quality, the cultivation, resources, land, education, looting for the thousand years, still claiming reservation, provision in the constitution, given by Baba Sahib for the oppressed representation. Ah, they say your charity, no poverty, elevation, academics, media, bureaucracy, justice system, private sector, politics, cinema, journalism, but the future of God are in our population. Ah, we build your houses, we till your lands, we produce your goods, we the Irish sons, it's our sweat and blood. So here you stand, don't take us marriage, you people not take lands. Ah, don't take us marriage, you. We for nothing plans cast one a one yeah cast one a one cast one a one cast one a one You made me question my birth, my parents, my human existence, color of my skin, my tongue, etiquette, my racism. I read I'm better gain some wisdom. My politics is all state quality prolific long range ballistic no please no solid state in my policy. Even your holy gun I can't wash away you and holy shit. Educate, agitate, organize, never exclude, appropriate, stigmatize. Educate, agitate, organize, never exclude, appropriate, stigmatize. When you see injustice, never close your eyes, always choose a side. When you see injustice, never close your eyes, always choose your side. Uh, speaking the hard truth is raising the bars, the bars like an antidote filling my scars. Speaking my broken wings, filling the gap. I'm conscious enough, know that real and the fast. Too many green flags lying in the grass. Give me something real, I'm a tired of the trash. The social system of the country makes me a cast. My ancestors say it doesn't have a fix. It only needs a blast. Baba Sahib says life should be great, doesn't matter how far it lasts. We build your houses, we till your lands, we produce your foods with the Irish sons. It's our sweat and blood, so here you stand. Don't take us merit, you put one of the plants. We build your houses, we till your lands, we produce your foods with the Irish sons. It's our sweat and blood, so here you stand. Don't take us merit, you put one of the plants. Ah, cast one of one. Yeah, cast one of one. Cast one of one. Yeah, cast one of one. Thank you. Thank you so much.